everyone, I'm Jessica Stutzman and welcome back to the Mill Creek Government Channel. Aquatic invasive species are non-native plants, animals, and other organisms that have evolved to live primarily in water and aquatic habitats rather than on land. According to the National Park Service in the United States, there are more than 250 non-native aquatic species from other continents and over 450 non-natives within North America that have been moved outside their native habitats. With us today is Sarah Stallman, Extension Leader for the Pennsylvania Sea Grant, to inform us of the most pressing aquatic threats to the Lake Erie ecosystem. Sarah, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for having me. Well, again, before we really jump into these aquatic invasive species, let's talk what is Sea Grant. Sure, so Pennsylvania Sea Grant is part of a very broad network. There's 34 total programs across the country. So pretty much any state that has any type of shoreline, coastline, Great Lakes shoreline has a Sea Grant program and a university affiliated with it. So here in Pennsylvania, we have Pennsylvania Sea Grants and we're affiliated with Penn State University. And so we're also getting support from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as well as NOAA, so the National Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Ultimately, our goal is to kind of bridge that gap between people and science. So taking research and scientific information and making it usable for our communities and our stakeholders to really be able to make decisions that are backed by science. And Sarah, you've been with the Pennsylvania Sea Grant for quite some time. How long have you been there? Yeah, I've been there for about 13 years now. I started as a coastal outreach specialist and in 2017 I became the extension leader. So I am now responsible for all the education and outreach programming that we do statewide in uh, Pennsylvania. So we have three offices. We have the Erie office. We have an office in Harrisburg that focuses a lot on the Susquehanna and Chesapeake issues. And then we also have one that's um, close to Philadelphia in Chester that deals with Delaware estuary issues. So I'm responsible for kind of coordinating all of of the programming that we do on a variety of environmental issues, invasive species being one of them. And we have had uh, a lot of your staff um, on the show to talk about different things, to talk about their research, to talk about shipwrecks, um, to talk about um, plastic pollution, things like that. So I am very grateful to have you on the show today to talk about the aquatic invasive species. And so what I wanted to ask first was, um, there are aquatic invasive species and terrestrial invasive species, is that right? That's right, yeah. And what would be the difference um, in some of uh, again, the species that you see from the aquatics to the terrestrial. Um, so terrestrial sp species, you're typically thinking about things like pests, like mm -hmm. insects um, and, and plants. There is some overlap. There are some riparian plants, like things like Phragmites, that are dealt with um, with the terrestrial aspect, but also kind of merge into aquatics. And so we do a little bit of work with Phragmites. Um, but typically, my focus is going to be things that are in the water, mm -hmm. <laughs> fish and invertebrates and things that are swimming around. Um, but we do work with a statewide council. It's called the Pennsylvania Invasive Species Council that deals with both terrestrial and aquatic species. And Aquatic species, again, they're coming from outside locations. Um, how do they travel to Lake Erie and what makes them invasive? Sure, so there's kind of two ways that I look at transport of invasive species. You can kind of think of that initial introduction. So if we're looking at something from the Caspian Sea region, which is where two thirds of invasive species come from, how are they getting into the Great Lakes region, for example? And then once they're here, how are they moving around locally? So those are kind of the two means of transport. Um, when we think about an invasive species versus something that's not supposed to be here, but is actually beneficial. So I always use the example of things like cows or corn. Those are things that we brought over here, but we don't consider them harmful. Mm -hmm. When we're thinking about invasive species, the definition in Pennsylvania is that they cause some kind of harm. Mm -hmm. It could be harm, harm to um, the environment, could be harm to the economy and our wallets, mm -hmm. and it could be harm to human or animal health. So that's mm -hmm. kind of where they get that um, invasive designation. They have characteristics that other native species don't have, and um, they're able to a lot of times outcompete and do better. So um, if we're thinking about transport from the Caspian Sea region, two thirds of those come from ballast water transport. Mm -hmm. So ships that are moving from place to place, carrying ballast water to stabilize the ship, when they get to where they're going and they're picking up cargo in the Great Lakes, for example, they dump that out. And then within that water is all those organisms that came from that region. Mm -hmm. 
when we're thinking more about local travel, like I, I mentioned, we're thinking about boats and trailers, and these things are often referred to as aquatic hitchhikers because that's what they do. They attach onto things and they get transported around. So um, that's one way. Another way is through the live bait trade. So a lot of times there are species that look like bait fish, like little baby round gobies, which we'll talk about. Um, you don't know they're in there and sometimes bait gets released and that's another pathway. And then another pathway that a lot of people might not think about is pets and aquariums and water gardens and release of unwanted pets that you know people maybe have purchased and no longer want and decide that the most humane thing to do is release them and that might not necessarily be the best thing to do. Yes, and, and working at the Tom Ridge Center quite some time ago, I do remember the exhibit, um, there was quite a large goldfish that yes. we had um, in the tank. Do you want to talk about when folks release their goldfish into Lake Erie, what happens? Sure. I mean, so goldfish are something people don't typically think about as an invasive species, but they, they are. I mean, we know goldfish are not native to Pennsylvania, and anytime you add something into an ecosystem, you know, you have the potential for it to have impacts. And so, you know, pet goldfish that people don't want, they just dump the tanks into the water and you know, goldfish can get pretty large, um, a lot larger than if they're in a fishbowl on, mm -hmm. on your table somewhere. And they can actually do a lot of um, rooting, uprooting plants, causing a lot of siltation and um, a lot of cloudiness in the water and they can really impact the habitat. Um, another example I really like to give is the red-eared slider turtle, which is a very popular pet. And when you purchase them, they're super cute and little, and you think, this is a great pet. What people don't realize is that these turtles can grow to be over 10 inches in diameter and live 20 to 30 years. Wow. So that's a commitment a lot of people really aren't prepared for. Mm -hmm. And so we see a lot of the red-eared sliders that are released as well. Wow. And so, again, we talked about the invasive species are a problem. You touched a little bit on, um, you know, the impacts. Are the impacts, again, um, do they hit a large scale or a wide impact to the Lake Erie region? So impacts are definitely going to be species specific. Okay. Um, it really depends on the species and what the characteristics are of those species, but there's a lot of them that really have wide ranging and wide reaching impacts. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we do is we work um, regionally um, with other states because some of those issues are exactly the same. So we're all dealing with zebra mussels, we're dealing with round gobies, and so we partner with states to come up with ways to kind of tackle invasive species. Um, but yes, um, impacts can be, like I mentioned, ecological impacts, and typically when we're talking about ecological impacts, we mean um, direct competition with native species, a lot of times things that might be threatened or endangered, um, we're talking about complete changes to habitats, and I can give a few examples um, here locally um, when it comes to species, and I'll actually show, this is a zebra mussel right here. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but there are a lot of these little tiny thumbnail-sized mussels that are attached to a larger mussel. Mm -hmm. These are native mussels. In Presque Isle State Park, there's an area called Thompson's Bay, and within Thompson's Bay, historically, there were 26, 27 different species of these native mussels. And after the introduction of the zebra mussel, that number dropped to six or seven species. Wow. So that's because you can see right here, they attach onto hard substrates. So they have these sticky fibers called bissel threads that will actually attach onto hard substrates and form these really heavy colonies, which is what you're seeing here. Um, this actually prevents the native mussel from opening its shell to release its siphon to feed or breathe. So essentially, it'll starve or suffocate. And so we've seen those direct impacts here. Yes, and so it has caused some of these species to go extinct then. In many cases, invasive species are responsible for species extinctions, yes. Okay. And have invasive species been um, a recent threat in history, or has this been happening you know, over decades or hundreds of years or thousands of years? Well, there's always going to be the introduction of species that could potentially happen naturally. However, most species are human-mediated. Most introductions are human-mediated. So mm -hmm. as we start to see things like shipping become big, that's when we started to see some species move. Um, opening various canals and waterways will also up open up avenues for things to move around. Mm -hmm. um, 
um, as you know, aquariums became popular, or you know, as settlers came over from Europe and brought various plant species. One uh, example is purple loosestrife that was brought over, and it's been here since you know the 1800s. So, um, yeah, it's it's kind of a, a long, mm -hmm. <laughs> long timeline. Although um, I will say that I think recently we've seen a little bit of a slowdown, and which is great. And I think a lot of that is due to um, you know education and outreach, and people actually saying, you know, I'm going to take the steps to mm -hmm. prevent these species from moving. So that's great news. Yes. And the, the um, zebra mussels, did those um, come from the hull of a ship or did that make its way in some other form? So zebra mussels are from the Caspian Sea region, which I had mentioned before. Two thirds mm -hmm. of introductions come from there and they also came from ballast water. Um, so one thing that's interesting about zebra mussels is they can spread by their adult form by attaching onto things, but they have a planktonic form. It's kind of like the baby zebra mussel. It's mm -hmm. called a veliger and it's planktonic, so you can't even see it. And it'll float in water for two to three weeks before it will settle down and start to build a shell. Mm -hmm. And so um, things like ballast water tanks, um, bait buckets, live wells and bilges and boats provide good opportunities for those um, little villagers that you can't even see to get moved around and introduced. Wow, that is just really incredible. And again, just, uh, we, again, we want to mitigate this and maintain it. So I'm glad we are educating our viewers. Um, <clears throat> what I want to talk about are some of the key species, which again, we did name the zebra mussels here. Some of the key species we're worried about here in Lake Erie and in the Great Lakes watershed. Sure. So I, you know, I've talked a lot about zebra mussels because they are like the poster child of invasive species. There's absolutely nothing good about them and they have so many different impacts. But a lot of people don't realize that they have a cousin and it's called the quagga mussel. There probably are some quagga mussels mixed in there as well. They're cousins. Um, they are from the same region and they have a lot of the same impacts. Um, maybe quagga mussels get a little bit larger, but you wouldn't really be able to tell the difference that way. Um, and they have a lot of the same impacts. We're actually starting to see more quagga mussels in Lake Erie now than we are zebra mussels. Okay. So that's interesting. One of the reasons may be that they are able to tolerate a little bit colder temperatures mm -hmm. and softer substrates for colonization. So okay. that provides a little bit more opportunity for the quagga mussel. Um, but we are always going to have them. It's mm -hmm. always going to be an issue. Um, and when I talk about zebra and quagga mussels, I always kind of talk about the round goby, which is another species that came from the Caspian Sea region. Um, what I'm showing here is a comparison between a invasive round goby and a native modeled sculpin. And so I always show the this comparison when people are talking to me about uh, the round goby because they're like, wow, they look exactly the same. They, and do. they actually do. You know, really the only way you can tell the difference is by looking at the pelvic fin and the round goby has a um, suction cup shaped mm -hmm. fin and the modeled sculpin has it kind of split into two. But these two came over together and well, the zebra mussel came first, then the round goby, but they have coexisted together in the Caspian Sea region, and so they're here in the Great Lakes together. Um, a lot of people say, well, that's great. They feed on zebra mussels. Mm -hmm. They actually have a little specialized tooth that they can crack open the shell and feed on them. Were they introduced to take care of the zebra mussel population? No, okay. they also came over in ballast water and they just happened to be from the same region and they do feed on them, but um, one thing to note about zebra mussels is that one female can have one million babies in a season. That's a, <laughs> that's that's a lot. lot. We, yeah. have to, we have to find yes. all of those and, and, and get them out somehow. So, so. There, there's no way mm. that they're going to be able to take care of the entire mm. zebra mussel population. Um, but there are interactions that happen between the two of them that are you know, not so good as well, like looking at things like type E botulism toxin in the lake. This can actually be facilitated by these two species. Mm -hmm. So zebra and quagga mussels are filter feeders. So they're taking in pretty much everything, all the little critters, um, plankton and zooplankton, which are essentially um, animal and plant algae, mm -hmm. and that's the base of the food chain. They're taking it right out. Um, and they're also taking in toxins and taking in pollutants and things that we you know, wouldn't want in our bodies, mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're concentrating them in their fatty tissues. Then the round gobies are feeding on many, many mussels, which is what we call bioaccumulation of those toxins into the body of the round goby. And then round gobies could potentially be preyed upon by species like smallmouth bass um, or birds or things that you know can facilitate further up the food chain. So we're seeing um, potential die-offs of fish and birds mm -hmm. because of type E botulism toxin. Oh, I see. And then they're probably, again, maybe the fish that we would fish for, humans would fish for, 
might be, again, preying on the round goby as well. It's, so. it's definitely a possibility. Um, some other species that we have here, this one always gets a reaction. <laughs> this is a sea lamprey. Um, and what we're looking at is a fish. A okay. lot of people think it's, it's an eel. Um, this is a, a fish in its own family with a suction cup shaped mouth that has all those little um, teeth. Mm -hmm. You can see they're like an orange color. And this will actually attach onto other fish and feed on the blood and body fluids of that fish. Oh my God. Oftentimes killing them. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a species that people are worried about that's not gonna attach to a person, okay. but it, it has had impacts in the past, mainly in the 1950s um, with lake trout populations and other fish populations as well. Mm -hmm. And they were introduced when we opened the Welland Canal. So there was a natural barrier, um, which is Niagara Falls, and we opened up that opportunity um, for them to swim into Lake Erie, so. Um, okay, Yeah. all right, so what else do we have on the table? There's a few more things I don't wanna to forget to talk about. Sure, um, the New Zealand mud snail is another one. These are super tiny, so you're probably not gonna be able to see them very well. Um, but this is another invasive species that we have um, had introduced into Pennsylvania, um, mainly in the central part of the state, but there was also an occurrence of this species in Lake Erie as well. Um, and they're very, very tiny, but they have a heavy impact, um, especially with um, macroinvertebrate communities and stream communities. And they're found where there's a lot of fishing activity. And so that can cause like a big impact for the fishery in the areas where they're found. Um, and the strange thing about them is that they have no natural predators, even though they're really tiny. So. Wow, absolutely. And they are very small. I would say smaller than, um, than a pencil eraser. I mean, they're very, very tiny. They're extremely tiny. And I actually have a picture of a boot that has a little tiny New Zealand mud snail on it. You can barely even see it. So wow. this is another instance where uh, an aquatic hitchhiking instance could happen where the species is on the boot and gets moved to a new location um, on a wader or something like that. Absolutely. Um, so that has the potential for that. Um, other species are things like um, invasive crayfish. This is a red swamp crayfish. Um, another one that we worry about that we found in Presque Isle um, recently has been um, the rusty crayfish. Mm -hmm. Both of these crayfish are, are larger and more aggressive than our native crayfish species. Um, the rusty crayfish you can actually um, identify by looking at the carapace, which is kind of this upper part of the body, and it has rusty colored spots on either side, which is okay. where it gets the name rusty crayfish. Um, one of the things that it likes to do is chew up aquatic plant beds. Um, and so I had mentioned impacts to um, habitats and environments. It can completely change an ecosystem. Wow. So you can look at a before and after of um, an ecosystem that has been invaded by rusty crayfish and see, you know, before the before shot with plants growing everywhere, fish everywhere. Um, it's a beautiful ecosystem. And then just looking at the, uh, the reaction after the fact, it's like an aquatic desert. Um, they, really? they take all the plant habitat out. Um, there's no good spawning sites or, or places for fish to hide. So it can completely change what an ecosystem looks like. And you told me an interesting, before the show started, you told me an interesting fact about the crayfish. Can you tell our viewers? Was it the, the ban? Yes. Okay. So yes, invasive crayfish can be very difficult to, to to tell the difference between native crayfish. And so um, in Pennsylvania, the Fish and Boat Commission has actually made a ban of, mm -hmm. of crayfish in Pennsylvania. Um, it's instead of trying to figure out, is this an invasive crayfish? Is this a, a native crayfish? They can hybridize. So sometimes those characteristics can get mixed and mm -hmm. very difficult to distinguish. Um, so you're not allowed to use them as bait in Pennsylvania. Um, you're not allowed to have them in aquariums or in classrooms. Um, you're actually not allowed to possess them alive at all. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, good for our fishermen to know yes. who, again, are watching. And you've got two more, I think, invasive species. This is actually just another, uh, this is the round goby, okay. which is essentially this that we talked about, just a little bit smaller. Um, and this, these are called bloody red shrimp. Um, <laughs> these are kind of strange little organisms that have chromatophores that mm -hmm. can change based on light situations, but it gives them a red coloration mm -hmm. that's not always there. Sometimes they can be more translucent in color. Um, and this is a species that actually, when I first started working at Sea Grant, I was monitoring for quite a bit because they had been found in Dunkirk, um, New York, and they were also found um, in Ohio. And so I'm like, they've got to be here. And so we did some sampling and we actually didn't find them. And then just recently, some Penn State Barron students were out doing some research and some sampling and they actually 
actually found them here in um, Presque Isle. So we have them here now. And they are also very tiny. They're yes. about the size, I mean, they almost look like Millimeters, thread from your yeah. clothing. That's how <laughs> tiny they are. Um, are there species that we don't have yet that we need to keep a lookout for? Absolutely. Um, one of the biggest um, things that comes up in questions that I hear are questions about the Asian carp. Mm -hmm. um, this is a species that we're very worried about getting in the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. We don't have in the Great Lakes yet. Um, we don't have in Pennsylvania yet. However, they've been moving up um, the Mississippi drainage uh, towards the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. There has been an electric barrier installed in the Sh Chicago Sanitarium Ship Canal that is pulsing electricity to deter those species from crossing into the Great Lakes. Okay. So far, um, that has been successful. So far as we know, there are no reproducing populations of Asian carp mm -hmm. in the Great Lakes. However, they have found um, individual um, and some DNA, but that doesn't mean that they're there reproducing. It could have just been an individual that came through or DNA could have came from scales or, or mucus or something that came through the barrier. So, so far that seems to be working. In um, the Ohio River, they're also there moving towards Pennsylvania as well. So that's another avenue we have to be on the lookout for is them potentially moving into the state through the Ohio River. Okay. And why are Asian carp so detrimental to Lake Erie? Yeah. So Asian carp, I like to describe them as like giant aquatic vacuum cleaners. They're huge. There's four different species of Asian carp. And the two that people hear most about are the big head carp and the silver carp. Mm -hmm. Big head harp, carp can be 100 pounds silver carp, um, you know, 50 to 60 pounds, and they open their mouths, their filter feeders, similar to an invasive mussel, and they swim along and just take in everything. And so they're planktivorous and they're gonna feed on the base of the food chain as well. So it really doesn't leave a lot for other species. Um, I like to think of an ecosystem as like a pie of resources, and you can only slice that pie in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And so there are species that are already present in that ecosystem using those pieces of the pie, which could be food resources, could be you know lights and nutrients, could be spawning habitat. Anytime you add something else into that ecosystem, you have to slice that pie differently, and there's going to be less, and in some cases, none um, for the native species that are there. And so the Asian carp is a perfect example of, of really consuming those resources. That was a perfect example. Thank you so much for wording it that way because yeah. that makes perfect sense. Um, are there any steps that our recreational water users can take to help prevent some of these invasive species? Again, I know that different groups are, are doing different things to try to prevent it, but um, you mentioned some may just be transported by boat or by shoe. Is there anything our viewers can do? Absolutely, and this is the most important part. Um, Everything, every little step that we can take makes a huge difference. Um, so I had talk, talked about some different vectors and boats being one of them um, or recreational water use in general. There is a national campaign called Clean Drain Dry. And essentially, that's it. Those are the steps that you can take. It doesn't matter whether you're an angler or a boater or a, a, a waterfowl hunter or a diver, anyone that's recreating in the water. So cleaning cleaning your equipment off after you leave a water body and not taking um, things to new water bodies that have plants on them, mud on them, debris on them. You could take your boat through a, a, a car wash and have mm -hmm. it cleaned off. So taking the time to really clean off your stuff mm -hmm. and um, being conscientious about that. Um, draining is making sure that you're not transporting water from one location to another. Um, so bait buckets, um, live wells, bilges, any water containing device that could have like those tiny little things Things you don't even know are there in them and making sure that you drain that at the at the source of where that water came from and not transporting that mm -hmm. and then drying these are aquatic organisms and so um, drying out your equipment will desiccate the organisms which is what we want um, to see happen um, one thing to note is that some species can survive out of water for more than five days um, so we recommend, you know, if it's a non-absorbent material like a boat or a kayak for drying at least five days. Um, if it's absorbent, like felt-soled waders where something could really be, you know, existing in that moisture, mm -hmm. we recommend waiting till that's bone dry and then waiting another 48 hours for precautions. Okay, and that reminds me so much of the Don't Move Firewood campaign, which is, again, the same thing to help, you know, prevent the spread of the emerald ash borer. And so this is the same thing. We don't want you to move water. Exactly, exactly. Um, how 
can our viewers learn more information about everything you've talked about today or any other projects that the Pennsylvania Sea Grant has going on? Sure. So our website is seagrant.psu.edu. We have a lot of different projects that are going on in ways that the public can get involved. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is this is a field guide that is specific to Pennsylvania that we have developed, and we have just finished a smartphone app. Um, oh, and good. Unfortunately, it's only available right now through the iPhone, um, the I iTunes store, um, but we're working on getting funding to make it an Android option as well. And it can be searched for under PAAIS, so AIS, Aquatic Invasive Species. This has like uh, 60 species in it, tells you how to identify it, where they can be found in the state, and you can actually report something new from the state as well, which is another way that the public can help. If you see something sketchy, go on that app, fill out a report, and send it to us so we can check it out. Awesome. Sarah, this was so informative, so informational. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing all of, again, these species. These are great props. Um, I just want to thank you for sharing all of this information with our viewers today. And thank you for having me. Viewers, again, we have talked a lot about different kinds of invasive pests to our local Erie region. And again, the big takeaway message here is not to move water. So again, making sure that you wash down your boat or wash down your boots, make sure everything's dry before you move on um, to the next aquatic ecosystem. I wanna thank you for tuning in to the Milk Creek Government Channel. And until next time, have a great day.